inviting me to give this presentation and there's so many friends in the room that I've told to bring something to read because a lot of what I'm going to say you will already know. Uh, let me begin with a confession. So when I was a teenager, I can still remember that, and particularly when I was 15 years old, I luckily met a person who had a profound effect on my life. She was amazingly clever, and I learned that when a clever lady tells me to do something, I should, without question, do it. When I first met her, that lady, also a teenager, was 14 years old. And she and I became a couple for the next five years. So, when Professor Laurie, Laura, who's apologised, she has to be at another meeting this afternoon, she told each of the keynote speakers to present for only 30 minutes. And at the end of that around 30 minutes, on their final slide, to raise questions about the topic on which they had presented. And so, I of course, remembering my teenage uh, lady, have done what a lady, a clever lady, Professor Laura, has instructed me to do, demonstrating what my good friend Professor Gisley Good Johnson would refer to as not only suggestibility, but also compliance. <laughs> my screen's gone dead. I can't see my screen. Thank you. I've learned from other speakers at the conference if you don't see this screen, but you turn around and look at that screen, you can't hear what I'm saying. <laughs> so I'm going to try to do something uh, feminine this afternoon, something that women can do. I'm going to try as a man to do two things at once. Because what I have to do when I want to forward the slide, I have to press this button for that and this button for that. So I might become uncoordinated, but I'm not having a beer yet, but I will have a beer later. <laughs> so, huh. Yes, so I'm summarising uh, what Laura told us all to do. And the title of this conference, you may be fully aware of, is From Research to Effective Practice. So that is the theme that I'm going to put through my around 30 minutes I might add a little bit and take a little bit longer, depending how confident I feel. I'm not very confident at the moment. You can tell my voice is quivering. So this is what I'm planning to do in the so-called 30 minutes. And many of you know this, that over 30 years ago, uh, the police in my country, with contribution of psychologists, developed a new method of interviewing people, particularly suspects. I'm going to talk about that. Then I'm going to talk briefly about evaluations as to whether that procedure is any good, not only studies in my country, but more importantly, uh, studies in other countries. And why those other countries is important is what I'll come to in point six. And you can see under point four, another thing I'm going to talk about is recently, I'm going to talk about some recent research. Sorry, Laura, but I need to, otherwise I'll walk down feeling disappointed with myself if I haven't talked about some recent studies. And then what I'm going to talk about under five is the beginning of an idea that under the auspices of the United Nations that a worldwide guidance document be written on how to conduct investigative interviews and then I'm going to briefly summarise what that document contains. So here we go, synchronise again. Now many of you know that this method, which in a sense by chance was, was developed in, in, in my country, is called the peace method. And you might know the history is that, as in many other countries, studies of real-life interviewing found that the people given the difficult task of interviewing in real life were actually not very good at it. 
why we were the first country to be able to say for certain that we were rubbish is in my country, in England and Wales, I have to say that because Becky's there and she's Welsh. In England and Wales, we had legislation that from 1986, all interviewing of suspects must be tape recorded. Initially audio tape and now quite often videotape. And as you'll be aware, one of the many benefits of that is that if you are lucky enough within or outside the police organisation to have access to those recordings, you can then make an informed judgment as to the, the level of skill displayed, what the strong skills are, what the weak skills are. And a number of studies were done in the 1980s, particularly by a Professor Baldwin, who's not here because I think he was a sociologist, but he was a very good researcher, and one or two other people doing their PhDs as police officers, John Pierce, Tom Williamson, they of course got access because they were police officers. So it was government funded, Baldwin or police. There was a handful of studies, well conducted studies, that analysed the quality of the interviewing that was now displayed on these tapes. And as I've said, the level of skill was very poor. And of course that surprised everybody, including the Association of Chief Police Officers, said, oh, we thought we were good, but we're actually on average not very good at all. And to their credit, they faced up to the reality of what the research told them and said, well, we need to do something about it. So in the middle paragraph, you can see here, way back in 1991, 12 very experienced detectives were seconded from their full-time work to come up with a new training, a new philosophy. And because I had worked in other arenas with the police since 1971, I happened to know some of these 12 detectives and I was very disappointed because guess what? None of them were women. And the little psychology I do know and my personal life has taught me that women are much better getting information out of me than men are. <laughs> you know, there is a famous saying you may have heard of that in conversation, men seek affirmation. You agree with me, mate? Yeah whereas women seek information. And I think we saw in one of the presentations during this conference a gender difference in the relevant social skills. Forgive me, I forget who presented that, but it was very good. I've always said women are better, but nobody says, where's your evidence? I said, <laughs> look around, mate. You know. <laughs> anyway, so these 12 guys, uh, they uh, were doing it full time. And it was those police officers, those men, some of whom who, who look more dangerous than criminals, it was those men, it, it wasn't liberal-minded, left-wing, pinko psychologists who came up with this acronym, this label, this way of conveying the principle of peace. It was these male, narrow-minded, very experienced detectives who came up with that acronym. And you can see in the final slide that what these men came up with actually contained a lot of psychology. So how did that happen? Well, a senior London police officer, Tom Williamson, who you can see here, had a BSc in psychology. But I need to tell you a bit about Tom, and I might run over my 30 minutes. But it's important, because Tom's no longer with us. So Tom was the oldest child in a very poor family. And when he was 14, I think it was, the school leaving age, when he was at school, was 14 in, in the UK. So the story is that his parents invited him to leave home because they couldn't feed him and the younger kids. So he left uh, living in the middle of the country. And what do you do? You go to the big city. So he came to London, my city. And when he was 16, in those days, you could join the police as a police cadet. So you could not even begin policing until you're way beyond 18. But when you're a police cadet, you begin some kind of training, you help sweep out, and, but you get paid. So Tom, having left school with no academic qualifications whatsoever, eventually joined the police, became a functioning police officer, 18, 19, 20 years old. And, and this is to encourage anybody in the audience who thinks they're a bit of a dumbo and isn't top of the class, Tom was 
soon recognised within the London police, one of the biggest police organisations in the world, as a rising star. He'd only been in the service about eight years when the chief of police invited Tom to join the anti-corruption squad, which had a lot of work to do in those days. And every year or so, this large police force, the London police, were willing to fund one person to go full-time to university to get a relevant degree on full salary. And this rising star who left school at 14, Tom, was selected to go to university. He was an unusual guy, as you've already gathered. And he did something unusual in going to university because many of his predecessors had made the sensible decision, oh, I'm a rising star in the police, I'm going to go places. I need to do a degree in organisational behaviour, management studies, the law. <laughs> Tom was the only second person in the history of British policing to choose to study psychology. And uh, I'm not religious, but thank God he did that. Because when he returned to policing and was now with, returning to policing several years, having got his BSc in psychology, so early career people, Nothing wrong with just getting a BSc. Uh, <clears throat> when that group of 12 detectives was set up to come up with new training, Tom made the decision that as a police officer, having studied psychology as a police officer, he realised that there were actually some things in psychology that were useful. Very groundbreaking at the time. And so what he did, as you can see here, is he got together another working party of a three psychologists and a couple of other detectives and we met on Sundays in our own time and what Tom wanted us to do was to review the whole of psychology in any allied discipline that could possibly contribute to improving the investigative interviewing particularly of suspects. So I have difficulty remembering some of my undergraduate days because I spent too long as an undergraduate doing other things but I do remember, and you may do it, did, did you ever study things like attitude change, persuasion? There was an arena of knowledge way back in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s on how to alter people's behaviour in a way that's not coercive. If you think of marketing, advertising, uh, a few years before this, and I, I'm now ad-libbing, sorry, I'm going to run over, I was involved in early discussions of how psychology could contribute to the training of medical doctors. You know, if you're a medical doctor, you need to ask a person questions in a way that's acceptable, that will get information, particularly if the person doesn't want to tell you everything. And I remember an example of this doctor coming along and saying that she worked in a sexually transmitted disease. Yeah, and people didn't want to tell her everything, but she needed to know everything of relevant. And so, in medical doctor training in a lot of health and nursing professions in my country, there was a contribution of psychology in the late 1980s. So there was a lot of psychology. So we collected all this stuff on Sundays and then uh, Stephen Moston was brilliant. So what Stephen had to do with all the stuff we collected is to compile it into an unpublished volume and Stephen's task was to try to make it jargon-free, readily understood, because many of those 12 experienced detectives on the committee that was going to write the training, they, they didn't have any degrees. So. And we, it was passed over, and we had no idea at all whether they would take any notice of it. But as you can see here in the final slide, to my surprise, one day at my office, I think I was working, just started working at the University of Portsmouth, this big parcel came. And we still had worries about IRA terrorist bombings and we had procedures. If you get an unexpected parcel, do not open it. Call security. So, Anyway, eventually when it was open, it, it was from the police. It wasn't a bomb at all. <laughs> and you can see here what happened. That there was this covering letter from the 12 detectives saying, we have decided to incorporate a lot of the stuff that Tom Williamson passed over to us. But we have been instructed in the writing of all the training materials and booklets that police officers have to read, that we have to write the training 
uh, for people whose average educational development by coincidence is a, a, a person who's leaving school at 14, like Tom Williamson. So they had to put it in very basic language. They couldn't have more than two clauses in a sentence. They could rarely use words that had, more, that had three syllables. Yeah, rarely use words that had more than two syllables. So they were very worried that in their translating what we, through Stephen Mostyn, had sent to them, they had maybe got it wrong or dumbed it down. Well, I have to tell you, it was brilliant. You know, we don't often grade undergraduate, masters, PhD students or other colleagues for their ability to them to write simple. We learn that later when we keep getting rejected from journals, they say, why don't you write simple? But we don't teach the students to write simple. But if I was grading students to write about psychology simple, I would have given this the top grade, all this stuff they sent. <clears throat> and uh, so what happened was uh, various training manuals were produced, uh, principles of training were enunciated, but of crucial was that from 1992, when they published this new training, the Peace Method, it was decided that though not everybody could be trained all at once, it took 10 years to train everybody, the 127,000 officers, that it would be given to those who would most benefit from it first, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But every police officer was given two booklets saying, you won't be trained for five years, but from now you've got to do this. <clears throat> So it was seen as very important. And so <clears throat> it took several years for most uh, detectives, most investigators to receive their training. And so though it began in 92, it was more than 10 years before any study started. And I just want to briefly share with you a study by my good friend, a guy I had the pleasure of doing a PhD with, uh, now Professor Dave Walsh. Uh, Dave, at the time we met, was a government crime investigator, and of course he had access to real-life recorded interviews. And that's what his PhD was about. So in one of his studies, uh, there, there are many, you can see here that in real-life interviews, he and a, a colleague, not me, because I've never been a real-life investigator, so what do I know? They evaluated the variety of skills that the peace method should be demonstrated for the, each of these 142 interviews, and compared that with the amount of information of relevance that the interviewee decided to give. So it's very difficult to prove cause and effect, and I don't have time to go into some... I might mention some time that showed maybe it is causative. And you can see here the bottom line of one of Dave's studies, which is those interviews which were closer to the training these interviewers had received, the peace method, the better the interview met the peace method, the more investigative relevation information was revealed, including, of course, the crucial point that a proportion of suspects are, in fact, innocent. So, Google Dave Walsh if you want to know more about that. Now, one of the things I'm going to finish on and ask your advice about and your views is to what extent this kind of thing stands any chance of being occupied outside the UK? because that's where it was developed in our culture, and we know culture effects are very important. And one of the things that the peace method emphasised uh, is what's called in the literature rapport. But in the acronym P-E-A-C-E, -E, there is no R. So you plan and prepare, and then you begin the interview where you have to explain to the suspect and their legal representative reasons why you are wishing to interview them, particularly if they've been detained. So you explain, that's the first part of the E, and then these males, detectives from England and Wales, said, do you have to engage in conversation? So that's the second part of the first E, explain and engage. But when you say to people, engage, particularly if I'm working in another country through translations, they think engage is something you do when you're in love to get married or when you go to the toilet and it's not available. 
So I said to some of these guys, even though there was a literature on rapport in the 60s, 70s and 80s outside policing, I said, why, why didn't you use the R? And they said, well, it wouldn't have made peace. But then they said, it's a French word. I'm not sure it is a French word. It looks like a French word. And you may know that between England and France, there's a lot of history. You know, Countries near each other don't like each other. And the further away they are, the more they love each other. And it's like university departments. You know, a d Disciplines near your own, you hate. But geography, they are OK. <coughs> so one of the uh, crucial things uh, that, again, uh, Dave uh, and a handful of others uh, Ulf Holmberg in Sweden, who himself was a, a, also a police detective, a crime investigator like Dave, they started looking at this word rapport. And you can see here very briefly another one of Dave's findings in these real life interviews, that if they were skilled enough to establish rapport with the suspect, so remember you're interviewing a person you have good reason to believe has done something bad, that's the suspect. And your training tells you to establish rapport with that person as if you were at speed dating or something like that. Now, how are you? That kind of thing. So it's very difficult to do, particularly if the person you're interviewing a suspect is relatively likely to be involved in serious abuse. Like, imagine if you're interviewing somebody... Uh, that you have reason to su suspect is a serial child abuser and your training says you have to establish rapport with this person. So, oh, fuck that. I'm sorry. Oh, I, oh dear. I'm not going to do that. Right. Anyway, so it's very hard to establish because it's not what you would normally want to do with such a person. And you can see that those interviewers who met a reasonable standard in these real-life interviews of establishing rapport, they managed to achieve it they were three times more likely to get a lot of information. They got three times as much information. And the relatively few who not only establish rapport, but in the face of getting relevant information from crime suspects, they were able to maintain it throughout most of the interview. It's very, very difficult to establish rapport, and it's even more difficult to maintain it. And it's not the kind of thing that the coercive model of interviewing suspects, you know, if you don't tell me, I'm going to hit you on the head. It's the opposite of that. So it's very difficult to be able to do this. And you can see here that those interviews in which they, these trained people could build and maintain, they got five times the information. And there's a host of other studies from a great variety of countries now that, that find the same thing as, as, as Dave found. But let's move on. <clears throat> so, as I say, there are, there are a growing number of studies of enormous relevance uh, to the basic principles that these detectives put into the, into the peace method. There's a nice study in, in Canada uh, where they looked at the, whether training can help people, and, and they did. And about 10 years ago, I think it was, Whenever President Obama became president, you know, the first thing he did was to sign a document banning that any agents of the USA should use torture. That's one of the most important things he did, in my personal opinion. Another thing uh, he, on behalf of the US government, did is set up a multi-million dollar research initiative called HIG. And it's something like Human Investigative gathering or something. It's, it's an acronym, like PEACE is an acronym. And so I was lucky enough to be invited at the very beginning of the HIG to go to Washington to, to explain, like I have today, what's the background of the PEACE, where did it come from, is there any, any evidence that it worked? And after that, the person in charge of the HIG initiative, a lovely lady called Dr. Susan Brandon, she said, oh, can you write all that up? You know, we, we'd love you to do the overview of all the available research, uh, which you can see was published in 2013. And that overview, which was now beginning to encompass research, not only in the UK and the USA, but beginning to include research from other 
I mean, the UK is weird in lots of ways, right? But we're beginning to get work from non-weird countries in that overview, uh, some around the Pacific Rim, for example. And there was a great consensus in these independent studies that were, some of them were at very beginning, so they didn't have other work to cite that they would be agreeing with. They were pioneering a lot of these studies in, around the world. And you can see here the, the key issues that came out of that overview that I, that I wrote for the that I wrote for the HIG. Oh dear, I'm going to go way over time. Okay, so I'm now getting into the more international, the slightly more interesting part. Uh, and some of you will be well aware of the groundbreaking study, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, by Ulf Holmberg and Professor Sven Christensen, published in 2002, where, as I said as in the, when I was a discussant yesterday, you know, getting the views of people in prison, most of whom have committed the crime, some are falsely convicted, of course, is a very important thing to do. It's very difficult to get access to do that, uh, but we need more research on that. And Ulf was one of the pioneers of this. And basically, you can see here that at that time, not now, at that time, in Sweden, like most other countries, there was no national official guidance on how to conduct interviews with suspects. And so the police in Sweden, as in my country, had to pick it up as they went along. And Ulf found that in terms of what the people in prison said, half of them said that they were interviewed in a kind of coercive, dominant way. I mean, obviously in Sweden there's no physical force. Sweden's too much of a lovely country to have torture or anything like that. But half of the interviews were done in what we call a domineering way. And the other inmates said that their interviews were in a way that Ulf labelled as humane. And as I say, this was the very first study that I know that did that. And, of course, the behaviour, the reported behaviour of the interviewer, these of offenders said, influenced their own behaviour. You can see here what happened. But the crucial thing was, and this is only by self-report, whether they confessed or not, but those who said they were interviewed in what Ulf labelled as a humane way, more of them reported that they confessed than those who said they were interviewed in a coercive way. And if you've got your experimental researcher on, you can start again begin thinking about cause and effect. You know, if, if a person's not telling you anything, yeah, I'm going to hit you then. But if I engage in rapport, I'm losing this night I hear, and you think I'm okay, you might talk to me. So you have to be aware in this field research about causality. So this uh, HIG, this human. Uh, massive initiative has produced lots of relevant research and you can see here uh, one of the early studies by Melissa and colleagues. Uh, in Canada, uh, Brent invited me to play a small role, shouldn't have my name on it really, but he put it on, uh, in a study that we did there. Uh, studies in Japan, uh, particularly by Taiko Wachi, some of you may know Taiko, she's brilliant and uh, her PhD won lots of awards for this kind of work, working in the, in the real-life uh, arena in, in Japan. Oh. Help! Did I do something wrong? No, 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 it's not your fault. Ah, thank you. <laughs> so as I said, getting access to real life recorded interviews is extremely difficult. So if you haven't got your PhD yet, do not think about doing it because it's very, 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 very difficult to get access. But I have one of my uh, now many PhD students, uh, Samantha, she was absolutely determined that the major part of her PhD, which, which, of which this is a study, uh, be the analysis of real life interviews. And in many countries, as I'm sure you will remember if you had 
well, I'm sure you all have a PhD or you're doing one, you have a limited period of time in most countries in which you can, between starting and finishing your PhD, and at the university I was working at, at the time, Leicester, if you're doing the PhD part-time, the maximum duration is six years. <clears throat> it took more than three years for Samantha to negotiate access to real-life interviews. That's why I'm advising you not to do it. But she eventually got there, and what she was very interested in, and one reason it took so long to get permission, is she wanted to get access to real-life interviews in very serious cases. And you can see here the nature of the serious cases. And by this time, we had realised, partly because of excellent work by my good friend Professor Becky Milne, that not everybody going through this peace training can become very good at it. You know, there are police officers who can be very good at shooting straight. We don't have many of them in the UK, thank the Lord at the moment. But, you know, police in my country are still not armed regularly. Uh, they have training if they're going to be a dog handler. They have training to be a high-speed pursuit car driver. And in those domains, it's always been realised that not everybody can do those things very well. But when you talk about interviewing, people get really offended if you say not, not all of you can become good at this. And so how the police dealt with that is remember that we have now recording of interviews and certainly also since 92 we have video recording the interviewing, all the interviewing of children and we have a lot of recording. And so what those recordings revealed is even though with training that was thought to be well-founded and good, not everybody could reach satisfactory and a small proportion could reach good and even small proportion could reach very good. So what the police service decided to do was to categorise the levels of competence. So the basic level, level one, I'm speaking loosely now, so don't contradict me, Becky, only afterwards when we're in the pub. So level one is kind of patrol officers. Level two is those who go to interview people who want to say something, suspect, witness or victim, normally witness or victim, about a crime that has occurred, like if you were burgled, you got home, if you were robbed on the street. So they have to have an extra level of training, they're called level two. To interview any child, any vulnerable person, in any kind of serious crime, like murder, sex, rape, you have to have extra training to level three. So the level three people, they've had a lot of training and a lot of selection based on their real life performance. So this is what Sam wanted. She wanted to analyse real life interviews in serious cases by people selected to have benefited from high quality training and this is what she found out. And you can see that we published our first study in 2017 when there was a growing body of research on rapport, not so much on empathy, I'll come back to empathy in a minute. Uh, Stavroula Sakara and her PhD with me had found that the president, president, oh God, I hate anxiety. The presentation of evidence, how you do it, how skillfully you do it, the timing that you do it as the interviewer was very important. So they, you can see here the skills that were most associated with the suspects who responded relevantly. But negative associations for explicitly asking for account, explicitly saying, you've got to tell me the truth, man, this is really serious, uh, repeating the caution when it's not necessary, uh, special warning, I don't have time to explain that. Situational futility is like many of these in the final paragraph, uh, was part of the major training in, in the world, the Reed method. Situational futility is basically your situation, well, you've worked it out, haven't you? Are you having post-lunch dip or is your brain working? Because if your brain's working, you've worked out what situational futility is, which is saying to the person, your situation is futile, but conveying it in a way. That is very counterproductive, at least in the interviews that Sam looked at. Looked at. Okay, so in those interviews with suspected murderers and rapists, these level three people, who normally are very good at establishing and maintaining rapport, now remember what I said about how hard that is with somebody you suspect of murder and or rape, etc. 
But imagine how even more difficult it is when that suspect chooses to tell you, to start telling you what they've done. So you've now got a situation where the suspect is revealing to you sometimes horrible information. And your training has taught you not only to continue to have rapport with this person, but to show what we call cognitive empathy. And we, cognitive empathy was explained by another able speaker uh, prior to this meeting, so I won't go into great details of that. Basically, it's understanding, demonstrating an understanding of the situation the person is now in. It's not, un, not demonstrating the same emotion as them. It's a very cognitive kind of thing. And a more recent uh, person, I had the pleasure of working with her on a PhD. Some of you know her in her earlier role in EPL, Bianca. So Bianca managed to get access to do real-life samples of recorded interviews in my country with sex crime suspects. And uh, in both studies, she found that the amount of investigative relevant information those suspects chose in a humane-style interview to volunteer, shall we call it that, uh, the more cognitive empathy occasions in which, the dem as Coral said, they took the opportunity, the interviewer, to demonstrate empathy. The more they did that, the more investigative relevant information was pri provided. But again, you've got to worry about cause and effect. But in one of Bianca's studies, we did a timeline because it's important to see is there a time relationship? So you may have worked out in Dave, Dave Walsh's study on rapport, the establishing of rapport at the very beginning comes before the suspect is giving any information. So if, you're, if you establish good rapport and you get more information, you could claim that time-wise that suggests causation, that it's the rapport that has led to the revealing of information. But I used to teach experimental methods, you know, when my first job was to teach advanced experimental methods when I was a proper cognitive psychologist. So I worry about doing these kind of studies, but they're so interesting compared to doing stuff in the lab that I, I'm kind of addicted to them. Okay, nearly finished now. Okay, so... You can see here, this is the last point, that... A number of countries around the world have become concerned that the traditional, sometimes very coercive, sometimes torture methods used in those countries, the countries themselves, members of the public, members of the legislation, have become concerned. And so for decades now, one of the United Nations conventions is what we call the Anti-Torture Convention. You know, there are a number of United Nations conventions very relevant to psychology, very relevant to psychology and law. And if you don't, you should read the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of Children. And the bottom line of that is, irrespective of anything else, the children come first. And that has had a massive impact around the world on the way children are dealt with as victims and indeed also as the perpetrators of, of, of bad behaviour. But the one I want to focus today is the, the one that talks about, I think I might have it here. No, it's boring, so I didn't include it. So there's the, there is this uh, anti-torture convention. And for each of these conventions, the United Nations appoints an expert to work on that convention for five years. Because you can't do more than five years because it's a very exhausting job, particularly if you are the special rapporteur to do with cruelty and torture. So Juan Mendez, he was the special rapporteur between 2011 and 2016. So I'm talking here about his final report. But in his earlier report, I think it's 2014, he names the countries in which his research suggested to him that these countries, which I'm not going to name, are still having torture there that is not prevented by the government. Obviously, there can be torture within a country that's not the government isn't aware of, but what Mendes is talking about is countries in which there is torture that the government is doing nothing about. And off the record, 
when he spoke to senior members of the, the government in those countries and said, you know, I have reason, I won't choose anybody, I, right. I have reason to believe uh, uh, Mrs. Prime Minister or, or Queen that in your country there is a lot of torture going on. Oh, yes, but don't tell anybody. Well, why are you doing it? How else do you get information from people? You know, it's that common sense view. And in Richard Leo's brilliant book on false confessions, 2008, he summarizes the common sense belief that many people, not us, but many people believe, which is if you have or committed a serious crime or you're planning to do so, you're not going to tell the authorities. That's the common sense view. And Richard writes all about that and how that is an, in the light of research, my mum has this view. She's dead now. But anyway, my mum had this view that we, I asked her, how do you get information from rapists? And she said, you have to do nasty things to them, then they'll tell you. And that's not true. Uh, so, Professor Mendes then thought from 2014, ah, so they're saying they're continuing to use torture or cruel inhumane treatment because they think it's effective. So he thought, what we need to do is review all the relevant research. Is it effective? And if it's not effective, which of course it isn't, is there anything that could replace it that's equal or more likely to help people decide to tell you the bad things they've done or the bad things they're planning? And so what he recommended, you can see here, I'm, I'm quoting from the, his final report, which you can find online, so he decided that there was enough research around the world, including by people in this room, I'm looking at some of you right now, there was enough quality research that there is a way forward to replace torture. And you can see here, he advocated the development, this is United Nations speak, of a universal protocol, that means worldwide document, uh, that would apply everywhere to all kinds of investigations. And in his 2016 report, he said that some states, that's UN speak for some countries, had moved away from the accusa accusatorial confession driven. And UK was, was one of the countries, there's Norway, New Zealand, there's a number of countries that before 2016 had done what he said in the second paragraph. And then the thing that I didn't know about, you can see, is the final part. So I need to share something with you now. Those of you who get nervous when you have to present, I want to share with you a story. So when Mendez was doing all this, I didn't know that what he was doing, but I got an invitation to go to the UN. And they said, can you come to the UN in three weeks' time? But it didn't really say much about why. But I already had a major commitment in my diary so I wrote back and said, well, I'm really sorry, uh, I have another, I told them what the commitment was. It might have well been something to do with the APL, actually, when I was president, maybe it was that, I can't remember. So I didn't go, and, uh, but a friend of mine, uh, a, a very experienced police officer in Norway called Aspion Ratcliff, he was at the meeting that I should have been at that I didn't go to. And a few weeks after, that meeting, this report was published. I didn't know anything about this report. And Aspion phoned me, he said, whatever you're doing, even if it's very enjoyable, stop it right now and, put, and look at your email. And he sent me this report and he said, read paragraph 56, and this is what paragraph 56 did, that Mendes and his team had decided that an exemplar for this new universal protocol, not the only exemplar, uh, actually be the peace method, what those men came up with in 92. Uh, so you can see I've nearly finished now. So a committee was set up and I was fortunate enough to be on this 15 person steering committee. It was a mixture of police, a few psychologists, uh, quite a few lawyers, a lot of people who are concerned with safeguarding and protecting people. In a positive way I label them as anti-torture people. And we got together and we spent three years writing the final guidance. And you can see here that when we, we all wrote our part short, 
because we knew the document could not be more than 40 pages because nobody in the UN would read it. When we all wrote short, it was over 100 pages. So then, oh, it was so challenging to get it down to less than 40 pages because all the prima donnas didn't want their 50 pages to be shortened. But in the end, after a lot of argy-bargy, we got it down. So when you look at it, it does not include everything that everybody wanted. It, it takes the major points, uh, and so when you're reading it, you, you, you might be a little bit disappointed, given your knowledge, but that, that was a, a, a compromise. So, final slide. Oh, you see, I knew I wouldn't be like a woman. <laughs> right, here we are. So this is a summary, it's my final point, and then uh, I'll show you the final slide of all. So you can see here, it's a kind of summary of what we already knew. But to see the work of psychologists, obviously myself and my colleagues are, are but a very small percentage of all the research that existed to go into the 2021 document. A lot of research from a variety of countries. So this is what it says. So I told some of my friends to, re to read a book because I wouldn't say anything in this talk you didn't already know. So you know all this, don't you? I hope you do. Right, so what are we going to do now? So I've been very naughty and I've not done what that lady, <laughs> Professor Laura, told me to do. I've run over by ad-libbing by about 10 minutes. So you can ask any question you like, but for me, these are some of the outstanding questions. Obviously a lot of people before me today have made the very important point in the field of psychology and law that is it too weird at the moment? You know, we, we need a lot of work in a variety of, of countries and when the peace method began to be adopted in other countries I got very worried, having had a small part in its development, that to what extent would it be applicable in other countries? So I do my very best, but I can only read English. Two, read everything I can find of, that has done work similar to the peace method in various countries and cultures. And I haven't yet found anything that says it's wrong or it's rubbish. You know, I've, I've found it's limited. Uh, sorry, I'm ad-libbing again. I had the pleasure many years ago of examining a PhD in the Netherlands which was a brilliant PhD, and one of the studies was the analysis of real-life interviews with suspects, and some of those suspects in the Netherlands were actually from North Africa. And the interviewers were pretty good. There was quite a lot of rapport and understanding demonstrated in these real-life interviews in the Netherlands, and it really confused the suspects from North Africa, because they were expecting to be tortured and they didn't know what to do when the police didn't behave as they would have done in their country of origin. So that's the only study I know and that talks about limitations. But you can see my final point. One of the, one of the wonderful benefits of being able to visit countries such as Romania and other places is you often get asked really good questions. So this final point was raised in Malaysia to me by a PhD student. And you can see the brilliance of what his question was. He said, well, all this stuff about real-life interviews, all this stuff, that's a fly, it's not me being drunk, <laughs> all this stuff about asking offenders in prison, it's restricted didn't know I was that attractive. Uh, <laughs> it's restricted to the suspects who've been caught. Why don't you do research on people who commit crime that haven't been detected yet? Because maybe they're different. I thought, oh my God, I never thought of that. So, there are some outstanding questions that you may have a view on those questions or you might last, like to ask anything else. I think we have time for some questions. Ask me one open question so I can fill in the time by a long answer. <laughs> Don't
Don't be polite. Please. Yes. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge is, understandably, you know, partly the old media movies that that, that you know justify coercion and oppression. Uh, getting people to realise, I, I what I'm going to say, I think is true of my country, that by the time they die, 50% of men in England have committed a. a have broken the law. You know, people think that lawbreakers are an unusual bunch of different meaning of weird, weirdos. But when you realise that breaking the law for a lot of people is a response to the situation they found themselves in, it's not so much a, a purposive act that they wanted to do since they were born. And, it, you know, it's realising that... Uh, Again, I'm not religious, but for the grace of God, there go I. You know, that, that police, of course, in many countries are screened, that when they join, at least, they won't have committed many crimes, but some of them do afterwards. We have a problem with that in my country at the moment. Uh, so I think that's, you know, thinking everybody's a baddie who deserves bad treatment, you know, particularly for serious crime, I think that. And it's this... It's this old-fashioned idea that, again, I, I go back to my first long-lasting girlfriend and my debt I owe to her, which is, she taught me, as my, you're a friend of mine, so you know, she taught me not to be macho. And it's getting these guys to realise. And that was why I was so amazed. Remember I said it at near the beginning of my... Oh, sorry. I said near the beginning of my talk, I was dismayed when I learned that the 12, guy, 12 people in my country instructed to come up with new training, I was dismayed that they were all men. Remember I said that? Well, uh, my worry wasn't justified. But, but in many cultures, uh, how can I put it? If you're going to disagree with me, men, do it in the pub afterwards. Don't do it now. But... Men are misled to believe in their socialisation, that they're kind of in charge, that they're responsible, that you know, they have to solve everything. They have to be macho. They have to be strong, physically strong. You know, it's a little crap, but that's what some societies tell you. So I think it's also a kind of socialisation thing. And certainly when I'm in uh, some countries I love, which are kind of macho cultures, I better not name Mexico in case that's offensive, so when you're in countries like that and you're saying, you're saying to these, these guys, what you need to do with a suspect in a serious crime is plan and prepare, and part of your planning and preparing is to get to know this person, what soccer team they support, what kind of beer they like, so you can establish some rapport and demonstrate empathy for their understanding. And they go, oh... Never thought of that. And then I remember, so I'm going to be very disclosing now, at the end of a two-day workshop in Mexico, the final question, don't make this the final question, was, can you in one sentence sum up if everything you've said in the last two days? Is there another example in life that is similar to what you're talking about that we in the audience can understand? And I said, yes, it's like dating. And they went, oh, right, they understood that. The macho guys understood that. Yeah, any more questions? We have time if you want. Well, I'll just say, oh, please, speak up. Is there a microphone for him? It's here. Just. I'm a bit deaf. I'm only 12, but I'm a bit deaf. It's not working. You have to shout.
right? Well, naively, I think that's, that's a good question, if I may say so, but naively, the more time you've got, the less time you need to rush. And, you know, interviewing in line with the peace method now, let's, I don't say the peace method anymore, I say the Mendes principles, because there is a big similarity, as you may understand. So, interviewing in line with the Mendes principles, you know, the, the philosophy is don't rush, take your time, well plan, have breaks, uh, go back to re-establishing rapport, demonstrate some more empathy. So the more time the legal system allows, as long as the suspect is treated well, would probably make it more likely that the skills could be demonstrated. I mean, again, my friends from the UK will tell me if I get it wrong, but I think when we take a person into custody, when they are arrested, we normally have 24 hours in the first instance, and we can re ask for another 24 hours but basically, unless in unusual cases, you have to get it done in 24, 48 hours. Am I right, Nigel? Um, 96. 96. Uh, yeah, 96 for murder, because it takes longer to interview in murder. Yes, yeah, so we don't have three weeks. Did you say in Japan you have three weeks? Two uh, weeks. Yeah. Well, that must be... Want to do some joint research? <laughs> <laughs> Shall we, uh, one more thing. As we, I said, Professor Laura, the organizer of this wonderful conference, is at a very important meeting on behalf of this university. So I was given this, and I want to thank you for it.